Biola University, thank you for having me. It's a privilege. When I was contacted by your university to be able to speak at your chapel, I said, this is an incredible opportunity. I was excited. So I hope this serves you in a way that, uh, that it encourages you to look to Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so it's a little bit about myself. I uh, grew up in the San Gabriel Valley here in Southern California, and I, I'm a second generation Japanese American. What does that mean? My, that means my parents were born in Japan and my, me and my brothers were born here in Los Angeles. And they, we were a blue collar family. My dad worked as a gardener in the San Gabriel Valley for, I don't know, 45, 50 years. And basically this is what our life was. I, I did not grow up as a Christian. Me and my brothers were the first Christians to be in our immediate family. And growing up, how we did life was that what I learned from my mother and father is that you worked hard. This is what it was about. Life is, is about working hard and you earn everything you have. And my dad, you know, my name's Rocky and, and he's a big sports fan and I'm named after a real boxer, not the movie, but Rocky Marciano was a heavyweight champion in the fifties, 1950s that is. And so he named me after a, 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 a boxer. So that kind of frames what life was like. It, it was blue collar. It was physical. It was, we love sports. That's kind of how we relate it to each other, sports and working together. And so I thought to myself as a, as a boy growing up, man, it'd be something else if I could play football at the University of Southern California, as Mike talked about. And somehow by God's grace, it happened. And I wasn't a Christian or anything at the time. My identity, meaning how I felt respected, how I felt important, the, my purpose in life was about playing football. And guess what? As I went through high school and to junior college at Mount San Antonio College and then transferred to the University of Southern California, man, it happened. But the greatest thing which happened was when someone, my own teammate, another Rocky, by the way, from Orange County, preached the gospel to me. And from that moment on, life was different for me. And my life verse here is out of 1 Corinthians 2, 2, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and am crucified. And I became a Christian in 1998, I think. But perhaps many of you guys listening today could relate to me. Although I knew I was a believer and I, I, I truly believe I surrendered my life to Christ and trusted him as my Lord and Savior, there was a tension going on in my heart. What was that? Well, you got to understand the world was affirming me. I mean, what I mean by the world, my family, my friends, people from the neighborhood, the, the public, people that got to know me, they knew me as the football player who became a football coach at the University of Southern California. I, well, you got to understand now, when I came in as a player, I was a, I was a walk-on. That means that I wasn't one of those guys that they recruited and asked and begged to come on. I was the guy who snuck into the back door and got onto the team. And from there, I was the person that gained a scholarship. And from there, I was able to come on to the coaching staff as a volunteer, then an administrative assistant, then a graduate assistant, then became the safeties coach, then became the linebackers coach and the defensive back coach, and then finished off as a defensive coordinator. And, and for you guys who don't know football, that's basically the second person in line to the head coach. And so for someone to kind of make it that way from a, as a volunteer or as a walk-on, that was like, wow, how did this happen? I knew it was God in my mind, but my identity was still kind of like, am I the guy who got all this stuff done? Or am I the guy who became a follower of Jesus Christ? I don't know if you could relate. Perhaps some of you are thinking to yourselves, man, I could relate to this because I know people affirm me. People see me a certain way. I go to the university at Biola. This is the degree I want to pursue. This is the career I want to pursue. Perhaps even your parents, even if you come from a Christian home are affirming you more for your work as a student than as a follower of Christ. So the world was coming on me like that. Like, man, you're the guy who did this. You're the guy who did that. I knew in my heart, man, I'm a follower of Christ. 
But there was that tension. Am I about Christ or am I about coaching football? And, and in particularly, you know, we're a high profile program and uh, a lot of people knew about us. So all the attention from the world is coming this way. But the Lord had his way and something happened to me. He kind of broke me down a little bit. And how do you do that? Well, basically, when, when I moved up to, uh, to Seattle, to the Seattle Seahawks, the Lord removed titles, the university that I loved, the, the area that I loved, Southern California, then moved me, my wife, my children up to Seattle where I didn't know many people where I was away from my church family that I grew up in. I was away from the university that I love. And now I was starting out at the bottom of it again. And during that time, during that time, I mean, I was, I don't know if I, if I was, uh, if I was uh, uh, depressed, but I was pretty down now. And during that time, I didn't have friends to turn to. During that time, I didn't have a career to say, man, this is what I love doing. Even the area, I didn't know very well. And so what the Lord drew me to is closer to his word, 1 Corinthians 2, 2. He said, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and I'm crucified. Could I say that? Could I say that I'm all about Jesus Christ and the gospel? Could I say that? So as I was digging into the word, I knew what I was taught by pastors and other mentors that I've had. I started to study, Jesus, are you the one who you say you claim to be? So I started looking to the scriptures. John 1 talks about the word was God. Jesus is God. Colossians 1 talks about he is God in bodily form. Hebrews 1 talks about he's the radiance of God. He's the brightness of God's glory. So what happened, brothers and sisters, is this. Instead of just relying on what was told to me, the Lord drew me deeper into his word. So instead, I guess that's our theme this this semester. Instead of just listening to what other people taught me, instead I started going right to what God was saying through the scriptures. So brothers and sisters, This is what I would encourage us to do during this time. I believe 2020 was a very clarifying year for all of us. All right. And in a sense, 2020 gave us greater spiritual vision to see what's most important. And perhaps this semester, things will kind of start to get back to normal or it might not. We don't know. However, I would encourage us is this. Let's make sure we take full advantage what the Lord has shown us in 2020. So in 2021, we're able to be submitted to Christ more surely, more purely where there are, there's less tension in our hearts. Now, brothers and sisters, until we were brought home to glory, there's going to be tension in our hearts. Amen. That's called sin and temptation. There's going to be that tension. However, God is giving us greater clarity of vision so that we could recognize these tensions. Is school defining you more than Christ? Is the affirmation from your parents defining you more than Christ? Is pursuing a certain career, certain degree defining you more than Christ? I don't know. Maybe you're in a special relationship. Is that defining you more than Christ? Now, let me get, let me make, set something straight. Coaching, coaching at the University of Southern California, winning, nothing wrong with those things. Pursuing a degree, uh, having a special relationships, pleasing your parents, nothing wrong with these things. These are actually wonderful things. However, someone who says that they're all about Jesus Christ and the gospel needs to have all those things at number two, three, four, five on down where Christ is the one and only one who defines us. Remember those other things may describe who we are. Yes. You're a student at Biola. Praise God. Yes. You're a family member to your specific family. Yes. You have relationships with people. Yes. Maybe God has called you to a certain career or goal uh, or a certain degree. Praise God. Those things may describe you, 
Hear me now. Those things may describe you, but only Christ Jesus will ever define you and me. And that's what makes us distinctly Christian. Because Jesus Christ defines who we are, who he is, what he's done, and what he's going to do. He's coming back. (laughs) He's coming back. The first time, brothers and sisters, he came as a lamb of God. He sacrificed himself. He willingly went to the cross so that you and I could be brought into fellowship with him to become friends with him. Instead of being an enemy, we get to be brought in perfect fellowship with him. That's why when Paul says, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, the second member of the Trinity, the creator of all things who spoke everything into existence. He's the one that said, let there be light. This same God is Jesus Christ. And Paul says, and him crucified. Jesus' death and resurrection gave us a way an opportunity to be with him forever. And that's the thing that he did. That's the greatest act of love that ever took place. Does that act of love define who you and I are? That we get to be with him because of his death and resurrection. And the next time he comes, he is not coming back as the lamb of God. He's coming back as a lion of Judah where he will est- do business with his enemies and establish his kingdom forever. Amen. And so my encouragement to you is this. If you are in Christ, you know, say, pastor, I am in Christ. Jesus is the one who defines me. I want to encourage you. Let's continue to seek the Lord and to to be very clear about the things we may have to repent of so that we could be more true to him. But perhaps maybe you grew up in a Christian home. And maybe your parents wanted you to get, come to a Christian university. Or perhaps you just found out about Biola University and you're not a Christian. You just want to come. You need to be in fellowship with Christ. Have you, friend, trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? What do I mean by that? Do you Have you trusted him saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to trust in what you did on the cross for me. And I want to submit my life. I want to follow you, Jesus, as my Lord, Lord and Savior. Perhaps today is a day of salvation for you. Perhaps today is a day where it's calling out to you and say, join my family. If this is a day, commit to following him. Commit by believing in the gospel and repenting of our sins and choosing to follow him as your Lord. I would encourage you, talk to one of your friends. Tell them what you did. Talk to one of your faculty members here who will care for you and to help you grow as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. So as Paul says, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and I'm crucified. Let's know that. Only way you could say this for your life and my life is this, is if you love Christ the most. Whoever or whatever you love the most will define who you are. Whoever or whatever you love the most is what you would want to be about. Whoever or or whatever you love the most is what you would want to talk about. What your life would, would like to communicate to everyone that knows you. Amen. So God bless you, Biola. Excited. What a privilege it was to be here. I hope this encourages you, brothers and sisters. And perhaps if you're not a believer, this will encourage you to come to know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let's close in a quick word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about Jesus Christ, your son. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us a way to be at peace with you. Father, I pray for the brothers and sisters here today that they will be encouraged that Jesus, you are enough, that Jesus, you are the greatest treasure of our lives. And Father, I pray for those right now who know they're not identifying you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, who have not entrusted their lives to you, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, that they would do it, 
that they would have their eyes open to see Jesus, that you are the greatest treasure of all and that they must have you. So thank you, Father, for what you're doing here at the university. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rocky, for being here with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank Grateful you. that you're here. Uh, hey, you know, we're, we're natural rivals. I grew up a UCLA fan. You went to USC. Uh, you went to Arcadia High School, which is the rival of my high school, Crescenta Valley High School. And so we're rivals. But so I want to take what you said, but I'm also like a little tense. You you know? Know? You how do you, how do you Mike, love in this? How do, Mike, how do you just got to go with it, man. You just got to go with it, you know, and... Uh, no, I mean, I love having fun like that. Rivalries make things fun, right? Doesn't it? I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about APU, but <laughs> I hear they're a rival here, right? And so, no, I just, that rivalry is just to kind of put that in perspective. I mean, UCLA actually made our football team better. Hmm. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, one thing is that that just made this, makes a season that much more exciting. Yeah. That just draws more people in and yeah. it, it makes things more meaningful. So... You know, I mean, although I wanted to beat them badly when we played them, you yeah. know, we played them how many years, like uh, 13 years. And uh, I'll tell you my record off camera here. I don't, <laughs> don't want to gloat too much. But um, but anyway, it just, but throughout the year, I didn't really root against them or anything like that. It was just kind of like, man, this is pretty cool, you know, that. Yeah. And our other rivalry was Notre Dame as well. So, we, you know, having good rivalries actually brings things up, you know, and yeah. like gives, gives more life. I love that. I love that. You know, you're a coach and you're a pastor. I'd love to hear what are some similarities that you see? What are some of the differences that you see in these professions? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. And I, I'm serving as a pastor right now, as you know, and uh, I totally believe that God prepared me to do this through my football life. Yeah. And there's a lot of similarities. One is it's about relationships. Mm. I mean, it's about relationships and, and mm. with players and coaches and other s- staff members in the church, no different. You mm-hmm. have a pastoral team, you have people in the church. And to be able to connect together, that makes all the difference in the world. Mm. I mean, Christianity is not a privatized thing. This is a co- very communal thing. The same thing yeah. on a football team. Yeah, You don't have a bunch of individuals, but you, you want to bring everybody together. So I'd say that's very similar in, 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 in a sense. John Wooden, a uh, Bruin, mind you, uh, who I learned from is a friend of mine. He, he just said, uh, coaching is teaching. Yeah. Right. And as a pastor, you're teaching, you're preaching, you're exhorting, yeah. you're warning, you're correcting. All that happens in football too. So very similar. The difference is, is this. Yeah. You want to know the difference? I'm, I'm ready. I'm okay. ready. In coaching, you had immediate results. Did you win or lose the game? Mm, that's good. Even if you lost... Does your defense improve in, against the run versus the pass? You yeah. know what I mean? Yep. There, there's ways to really measure your progress. Yep. In pastoral ministry, the Lord's teaching me just be faithful. Because mm. I have no idea what's going on in the heart of person for sure. I mean, I, I may have a clue, yeah. but do I really know, is this person loving Christ more? Mm. Are more people coming to love Christ? I don't know. At the end of the day, that's up to the Lord. Yeah. Right? So... Being faithful is what, in a way, the Lord's humbling me in that way because in coaching, we're able to win, you know, and and yeah. despite what anyone else thought or said, well, you know what, we just won the championship. Yeah. Right. We just beat UCLA, <laughs> right, nine years in a row or something like that. But it you was... know, we could we could point to things like that, but in ministry, even the size of the, of the church, even even other things that you may like to think you could measure. Mm. You know what? All that's up to God. It's like, really, am I being faithful, ministering, preaching the word of God? Mm. And that's where, that's, that's, a, that's a difference there now. Mm. That's good. That's good. Is there something you learned from football that you wish the church would know a little bit more? Well, I mean, one thing, it, just being around football people, football people are very passionate people. Mm. How could you not be when you sacrifice your body? Yeah. How could you not be when you're sacrificing so much time away from your family? Mm. I mean, as a coach, I mean, we, were, we used to work like 90 hours a week during the season. I mean, it was a full-on commitment. And why? Yeah, I mean, it, at the levels that I was able to coach at, at the University of Southern California, at the Seahawks, there was a lot of good returns. But, I mean, that wasn't the major motivating factor. You did it because you love the game. 
and you you're around a collection of people who love the game. You had a common love, common passion, common level intensity for something. Yeah, I love that. Yep. In the church, are we common? Do we have a common love for Christ? Mm. In the church, do we have a level of passion for Christ that 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 we we could all relate to? Mm. Do we have a level of intensity of, of wanting to follow Him and learn more about Him and mm. to and to have other people know about Him more? Do we have that? Mm. I'd say it's more varied, mm. and 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 this is where I believe like things such as in the secular world, like football, could teach the church. We're like wow. We love football, but how much more Christ, right? How much, yeah. how much more passion for Christ? And I'd say just that level of love and that singular focus is, is very evident in football. In yeah. most football teams, I'd say, I can't say all of them, but for the teams I've been on. Yeah. And so I would love for the church, the global and the local church to just be on fire for Christ. Yeah. I mean, what, at the end of the day, what else, who else matters? Yeah, I love that. I love that. I mean, one thing you did uh, touch upon in your sermon was that you learned a lot from 2020 and it gave you new spiritual glasses, right? Mm -hmm. What are some of the lessons that you're taking into 2021? Well, just repenting to my family and, and my, mm -hmm. my wife and my children the other day or pride it, it, the pride of feeling like you're in control like you could mm. actually change things as if as if the results are up to me now mm. in my mind i know god is in control god is the one who's sovereign amen yeah. however does that truth does that doctrine affect the way i think and how i approach certain things where like i said earlier just be faithful yeah just be faithful and, and so what 2020 has taught me is just to it's really humbled me in a sense of like when you're in ministry, you're serving people, you're serving families. Yeah. People are going through difficult things. Yeah. Uh, I go through difficult things as a fam as a family man myself. It's not up to me. Yeah. I just need to serve in the unique role that I have is to minister the word and shepherd the people, pray for the people and just trust God for the results. Yeah. I mean, you know, coaching feels like it has this adrenaline. You're always on on top of things, right? And as pastor, you're saying, it's about being faithful. There's a slowness to it. How do you, how have you seen yourself adapt to that? How have you been rooting yourself in this faithfulness? One of the things in football is that um, distractions are the enemy. Mm. What I mean by that is that at the end of the day, it's football. It's playing a game that you love, mm. playing in a game that you grew up playing for free yeah. in the backyard in the alleyways, in the parking lot, at the high school. You did it for free. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, things come in. Scholarships, contracts, attention from other people. Then all of a sudden, your eyes start going to different places. Yeah. So as a pastor, what keeps me focused is staying in the Bible. I mean, honestly, mm. I don't study the Bible just to preach and teach. I started the Bible because I need to know the God that I say I believe in. Yeah. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Do I know Christ well? And so, uh, I mean, that's one of the blessings of being able to preach regularly. That, mean, that, that just means I'm in the Bible constantly. Yeah. yeah. And that there's a sanctifying effect to that. So, I mean, I, I just try to stay in the Word. Yeah. You know, and, and trying to surround myself with other men and women who love the word, who love the Lord. Yeah, no, I love that. I love how simple it is, but how profound that is to, to simply stay in the word and to, to root yourself. You know, uh, one of the things you did say is that achievements and affirmations, mm -hmm. they can distract us, although sure. they're very important to us. How have you seen yourself give affirmations or um, recognize achievements a little bit differently now that you know Christ? You know, I mean, that was a, that's a great question. Bible says, get, render to on, a, a, honor to those who deserve honor. I mean, I think it's great to affirm people, you know, yeah. and I think, I think just, hey, that was a great job. Praise God, man. I could see how the Lord has gifted you in this. I could see how the Lord has given you a, an intensity, a resolve to persevere through this. You know, and, and I think there's a way to say it, even as you raise our, my own children at home. Yeah. Man, look how God gifted you in calligraphy. Look at how the Lord has given you a mind to remember incredible stuff. What are mm. you gonna do for do with it now? Yeah. You know, and so I think there's a way to affirm people, but at the same time, gently remind them at the end of the day, it's from God mm. and for God Himself. And so mm. I think it's important to be positive. I think it's important to say good job and well done, 
but at the same time, be able to speak the truth in love when where there needs to be correction, where there needs to be kind of maybe a confrontation once in a while. So that so when you praise somebody, there's it actually means something. Yeah. Right. And there's yeah. a balance there. And so I think that there's a it, praise could be a double edged sword. It's a blessing, but for all of us, me included is that it could be a temptation to look at ourselves mm. and make it about ourselves. So, and then there's a constant thing where when we talk about it ourselves, these are the struggles I have. I mean, every time I preach, I'm, pray, I'm praying to God, Lord, guard me from sin, guard me from touching the glory, guard me from making this about myself. Yeah. No different when we're playing in a Rose Bowl or Super Bowls. I mean, it's no different. Like, Lord, this is about you. We want you to become more famous. This is not about my career. It's not about this. Because there's a constant tension. Yeah. I think that tension is going to be there for to the day we were brought home to the Lord. Yeah. And uh, so I think it's being honest with people. Yeah. I think they kind of understand your heart too. I mean, it yeah. sets the culture in your home, in the church, wherever you're working or living, you know. So just being honest in that way, I think, really helps shepherd people in yeah. that way. Yeah. Well, thank you for your words today, your wisdom, your passion, even your focus in the way that you've approached everything. So grateful for your, your time here with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a great honor to be here. Thank you. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.